Assalamu alaikum students. Today we'll be discussing uh, the, the various aspects of cardiac failure. Uh, we have a busy schedule in this lecture. First, we'll uh, define cardiac failure, uh, look at its uh, various causes, uh, go into some details of the stages of the cardiac failure together with uh, what the body does in terms of compensation. Uh, then we'll look at the types, uh, the clinical manifestations, i.e. signs and symptoms. And at the end, uh, we will conclude by looking at cardiogenic shock, uh, which then will proceed tomorrow uh, on the concluding uh, lecture of uh, various circulatory types of shock. So what is cardiac failure? Basically, it's uh, a failure of the heart uh, to pump enough uh, blood to come to the needs of the body. It's usually uh, accompanied by, almost always accompanied by a congestion uh, in the peripheral organs. Uh, if it's the right side, if, if it's the right-sided failure, it will uh, lead to congestion of the uh, peripheral body. If it's the left-sided failure, it will uh, lead to congestion of the uh, lungs. So we call it congestive heart, heart failure, uh, and it's uh, it's it's pathophysiology meaning meaning the what goes wrong basically. That's pathophysiology. Uh, it, it, it basically uh, circles around two aspects, the decrease in cardiac output and the compensation that the body puts up. Okay, so this is a, a nice table uh, to show you uh, an outline of the cause of cardiac failure. Uh, on the left, you'll see impaired cardiac function. So uh, there's something wrong with the heart itself. And the other is excessive work demand, uh, whereby you need to understand that the heart itself originally was not at fault. Uh, there was something funny going on in, in the rest of the body, which then put uh, excessive work demand on the heart and eventually heart went into failure. We, we look at the impaired function first. Uh, so myocardial disease, uh, the myocardium itself uh, has developed some problem. Uh, it has, uh, it has, uh, uh, change its shape, maybe has dilated abnormally. Uh, if there's an infection somewhere, uh, the coronaries are insufficiently supplying blood to the uh, to the myocardium, uh, or there is blatant myocardial infarction, which basically means part of the myocardium is is uh, not functioning now. Uh, uh, there can be problems with the valve. Maybe there is stenosis or regurgitation, uh, or maybe there is uh, a heart defects uh, right from the birth, uh, and if if all of this is okay, uh, the covering uh, of the of the heart uh, pericardium that may uh, be problematic and can lead to cardiac failure. Uh, the second column here is excessive work demand. This is interesting because the heart originally, as I said, is okay, uh, but there might be increased pressure work. So there's, there's you know the the same old hypertension comes in uh, systemic or pulmonary. So the afterload increases significantly, which means that the heart needs to now compensate for the increase in afterload uh, scenario and has to pump extraordinarily uh, which then leads to hypertrophy of the ventricle muscle and eventually leads to uh, cardiac failure. Uh, increased work volume is again is uh, we've discussed this uh, AV shunt so arterial blood shunts into uh, the venous side bypassing the, the tissues uh, the tissues become hypoxic that gives a signal to the heart that the perfusion, perfusion is not happening, the oxygen demand is not being met, substrate demand is not being met, and hence the, the, the heart translates that into even more cardiac output, and so eventually fails. Um, excessive intravenous fluids, again, the preload would increase, and that would eventually lead to problems. Increased perfusion work is also interesting. So there are, there are diseases, paratoxicosis, that is hyperthyroidism. You will study this in endocrinology or anemia where the demand for circulation uh, increases so much that the heart eventually gives out. These are some of the causes, some of the outlines of cardiac failure. This by no means is exhaustive. You will obviously be dealing with this issue, a very common issue, by the way, uh, much more in detail and from the uh, treatment and management point of view uh, in clinical medicine. Okay. Now, the stages of cardiac failure. So cardiac failure doesn't just uh, happen, not, all the, all, uh, not in all cases. Uh, in a few cases, indeed, it just happens su suddenly and it leads to death and that's the end of the story. But generally speaking, 
it does follow uh, a course. So there is an acute stage, and remember we're talking about moderate uh, cardiac failure. So in moderate cardiac failure, there's an acute phase uh, in which you have the two features, the, the decreased cardiac output as I mentioned, and the resultant congestion, which here is mentioned as venous cooling, whether it's systemic venous cooling or lungs, depends on which side of the heart has failed. Um, and just a footnote here, if the initial uh, cardiac failure is severe, i.e. not moderate, if it's massive, it's uh, too much. Uh, uh, for example, some MIs are so big, the infarction is so big that the, the, the rest of the heart just, you know, doesn't matter anymore. Uh, in this case, uh, unfortunately, death happens suddenly in, uh, during the acute phase. So as soon as the symptoms comes, come, come in of cardiac failure, the person dies within hours. Uh, so this being an exception, uh, we'll go back to the moderate cardiac failure. So acute phase of moderate cardiac failure is basically all symptoms and all the signs which come around because of decreased cardiac output and venous pooling. Then you have chronic stage of this moderate uh, cardiac failure in which, uh, as I mentioned, the compensatory mechanisms, they kick in and they, they sort of save the day, uh, proverbially speaking, uh, we call it recovered or recovery has happened and this heart now is compensated. Of course, it's not uh, as good as the original heart, quote unquote. It is recovered or compensated, uh, but it but it do, does the job. And with with certain dietary restrictions and certain exercise protocol, uh, the person uh, lives a, lives a normal life. So that's that's moderate cardiac failure. However, uh, there's another type uh, which obviously either the massive cardiac failure led to death or if the person survives, then he or she enters a more chronic stage uh, in which uh, no type of recovery is possible. And we call it uncompensated cardiac failure. And eventually uh, this person struggles uh, his or her way to uh, demise. Okay. So this is an overall, overall uh, slide discussing the various stages of cardiac failure. Uh, the moderate, uh, and in case it's severe, the acute is, is certain death and more chronic of severe cardiac failure is basically an uncompensated cardiac failure. Uh, I would like you to remember from this slide uh, the two key words which are uh, colored here, compensated cardiac failure and uncompensated cardiac failure. Please remember that compensated cardiac failure is uh, of moderate uh, uh, failures, while uncompensated is either the moderate cardiac failure has not been managed properly and it has entered into uncompensated or that the initial uh, injury, insult was so severe that there is no uh, recovery phase or or, 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 or or a phase where construction can happen. It directly goes into an uncompensated phase. Okay, so we are now talking about uh, the compensated cardiac failure. Okay, uh, we looked at the acute phase. We look at the, we look at the chronic phase. The acute phase is 30 seconds to a minute. So it's very, very tight window really. And you can see how seconds count post cardiac failure. Uh, and this is where the, the patient, as you will see, uh, uh, is struggling to, to, to manage this acute phase by uh, putting on loading up uh, compensatory mechanisms uh, so that uh, the cardiac output is improved and uh, the venous pooling is, is addressed. Okay, it's all about that. Remember, it's all about increasing the cardiac output and it's all about decreasing the congestion, uh, avoiding the edema and all that sort of business. Uh, and one more thing before we go into this uh, in detail is the heart and kidney. They basically, uh, you need to uh, imagine that the heart and kidney and circulation, these are the three main actors in cardiac failure, all right? If you decrease the cardiac output significantly, you basically, you basically uh, decrease the uh, renal perfusion. And when you decrease the renal perfusion, uh, the kidney translates that into, I, the kidney needs to uh, retain fluid. Whenever you decrease tissue perfusion of the kidney, the kidney will retain fluid, okay? So that's, that's one thing. When you decrease cardiac output as a result of cardiac failure, the kidney, the kidney's perfusion will go down and it will start retaining water in an already stasis ridden circulation. So you already have congestion because of cardiac failure. And on top of this, kidney has decided to retain more fluid. This is a very bad situation 
and this you will see throughout the compensated and indeed in the uncompensated uh, cardiac failure this is what uh, basically breaks the uh, camel's back uh, proverbially speaking so remember heart kidney and circulation these are the three actors which will be uh, which will be discussing throughout cardiac failure so we start from uh, this graph it's a very nice graph of brighton uh, it, it, it's it's that typical uh, cardiac function curve that we have been discussing in the previous lectures so cardiac output is, is plotted on the y axis and right atrial pressure on the uh, i beg your pardon cardiac output on the y axis and right atrial pressure on the x axis and the red curve here is the normal curve okay this is the normal if you remember this is the normal uh, cardiac function curve now the acutely damaged heart is in blue so this heart it was functioning fine but suddenly uh, there was a there was an mi the myocardial infarction or some something went wrong uh, from the from the cause list that we discussed so this dropped and became the blue curve so you can now see that there are two issues with uh, this blue curve and you should be able to read this uh, analytically now because we have discussed in detail the cardiac function curve so if you drop this curve to the right and to closer to the x axis which basically means that cardiac output has obviously decreased uh, the point a is normal cardiac output 5 liters per minute it has now plummeted to point b okay which is nearly half so clearly this is a significant uh, heart failure and uh, this plummeted down and this basically resulted in an increased right atrial pressure and you should be able to now work out why did the arterial pressure increase? Because the heart is not pumping enough, and the blood is being uh, uh, the blood is uh, collecting in the heart. It's being dumped in the heart. The preload is coming through. The venous return is coming through, but cardiac output has dropped. So uh, within the heart, you will have increased preload, which basically increases the right atrial pressure, um, and and this is a very bad situation. Okay. So now you you, you the heart went from point A to point B. Okay, but then something happened. Something happened. The acute phase uh, compensation happened. So then, what happened is the this um, how do you describe this color? It's a dark greenish color, all right. Okay, so it basically went the cardiac function curve then went from this blue line to this dark greenish line. Okay, and now we have a new point, the point C. This is where the damaged heart. Uh, uh, was improved or helped by the sympathetic stimulation. Okay, so things improved. Cardiac output improved, uh, and and right atrial pressure not so much uh, because definitely the heart is in the failure stage, and this is the problem with heart failure that uh, you have compensation. You sort of improve the uh, the function of the heart by by addressing the cardiac output, but it's not enough to clear out the heart from its uh, 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 backlog, from the, pre from the preload, the, the, the venous return which is coming in. And hence it's always struggling uh, with that preload, uh, which is uh, uh, depicted along the right atrial pressure curve. Uh, then uh, later on, uh, you do uh, the chronic phase and you do some, some more stuff, which we'll discuss and uh, you have a partially recovered heart. Point D basically means that the heart is now recovered, compensated. Okay, it's a compensated heart. And uh, this light green curve basically is of the compensated heart. So it began from this red line, normal person, heart failure took place, acute phase, then acute uh, recovery happened. And then you have a chronic uh, recovery that happened uh, along this uh, light green line. And point D then became your reference point from point A. So this is the story of the heart failure, which went from A to D. Okay. Now we'll look at the acute phase. Uh, as I mentioned, it, it basically manifests as a decrease in cardiac output and venous pooling. Okay. Now compensation now will happen through the sympathetic nervous system reflexes, the baroreceptor, the CNS ischemic response and chemoreceptor reflex uh, response. All that that you have discussed under uh, uh, control of arterial blood pressure, they come into play because as soon as you have decreased cardiac output, you will have decreased uh, blood pressure. I hope you remember the formula for blood pressure is cardiac output into 
total peripheral resistance. So if you decrease cardiac output, you, you decrease uh, blood pressure. It's the decreasing blood pressure that basically signals to the sympathetic nervous system through baroreceptors and all those reflexes to increase contractility and heart rate, okay? And then also uh, increases venous return by squeezing the veins, the uh, capacitance vessels basically. They are also squeezed to improve venous return further. Now, uh, this is the mainstay. This is when we say compensation. This is the this is the acute compensatory mechanism. Somebody asks you in a viva, how does cardiac failure compensation work in the acute phase? You pop out this question, this answer rather. So the sympathetic nervous system uh, uh, gets uh, active. It improves uh, contractility, improves rate, and increases venous return. Uh, and this happens within a minute. Okay, so a point to note. Uh, then what happens? Then basically the chronic phase happens, which spans from minutes to days. What happens in this? Now, this is a very important point here. Fluid retention by the kidneys. Now, I mentioned uh, just now that you need to remember those three things, the heart, kidney, and circulation, right? And I mentioned, I described fluid retention as a bad thing. Keep that in mind, okay? But now we will address, we will add some, a little more finesse to that argument. A little fluid retention, uh, the, or rather the initial fluid, fluid retention by the kidneys, when they sensed that something bad has happened, they calculated from the decreased uh, perfusion uh, due to the decreased cardiac output that something has gone wrong, and they started ret retaining fluid. Initially, this is not a bad thing, really. It's the, the problem is, uh, I'll first tell you why is it not a bad thing because it tends to improve uh, uh, the MSFP, the mean circulatory filling uh, pressure, which which basically uh, improves the venous return and via the Frank starting law tries to jumpstart uh, the cardiac output. However, uh, too much fluid retention is basically the feature of a failing heart. Okay. Uh, and that leads, that basically is the congestive part of congestive cardiac failure, okay? So too much fluid retention, if the heart does not address, uh, look, it's a whole, remember we, the diagram that we, we discussed of the pump and the two tubes, okay, right in the initial discussions. But the heart is not doing its job. It's not providing the movement of the fluid. The fluid is now accumulating in the periphery, either in the lungs or in the periphery, it doesn't matter. The problem is the fluid is not circulating properly you will have congestion. You will have uh, uh, the, the cardiac output will, will be struggling because it needs that venous return to come in and, and, uh, and then it pumps it further. So the basic issue is fluids displacement from not coming back to the heart and collecting el elsewhere. However, during, remember, during moderate cardiac failures, compensated phase, the initial fluid retention is a good thing. Too much fluid retention is a bad thing, and I would like you to note down, uh, note this down uh, somewhere. Why is too much of fluid retention a bad thing? Number one, it increases the work load on the heart. Okay, obviously, and the heart is already not in a very spiffy uh, situation. Then, num uh, then number two, it overstretches the heart, so uh, it further uh, increases the physical load on the heart. Number three are the two, three and four are the two edemas. It eventually leads to edema in the in the in the lungs, which open the door to all sorts of problems, as you have discussed in respiratory physiology, and peripheral edema, which obviously is a problem because it will decrease venous return. Okay, so once again, a, a little degree of initial fluid retention is a good thing because it improves MSFP venous return and hence Frank Starring law induced cardiac output. Too much fluid retention due to these four, four issues is not good, uh, and we move forwards. The second point of chronic phase or chronic uh, compensation is the heart recovery itself. So for example, the heart basically was uh, faced an infarcted area. Uh, what, to, what to do now? All of this, if you notice all of this, these are secondary things. This is beating about the bush in that sense. It saves lives, okay? I'm no, not undermining these things. These, these points save lives. So if it's a sympathetic nervous system basically kicks in and saves life by increasing uh, temporarily, increasing contractility and improving venous return uh, through, it, let me say, uh, uh, doesn't address the issue, does it? 
it's it's synthetic it's basically manipulating the caliber the, the di diameter of the of the vessels uh, it's it's not addressing the main thing uh, number two is uh, fluid retention uh, fluid retention is done by kidneys again this is a manipulation with ecf volume to improve uh, cardiac uh, uh, output through increasing venous return uh, so in fact it's actually putting a bit of a load on the heart itself right it, it's depending on the heart but who's going to address the heart so in chronic phase after many minutes or hours and uh, right up to days what starts to happen is the heart itself starts to recover uh, if this is to go to a full compensated scenario it, it 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 basically goes into recovery which spans from weeks and months and you you know angiogenesis we've discussed this in local blood flow control uh, new vessels new collaterals of the coronaries they they start stopping up uh, and you have better uh, blood supply of the uh, of, of the of the of the heart and then the undamaged portion of myocardium goes into hypertrophy which then improves the uh, functioning of the remaining myocardium this is how the heart itself uh, improves and recovers and adds to the overall compensation so now we basically are continuing with our scenario of cardiac failure but this this heart has has had a severe beating so it's severe cardiac failure it will eventually go and become a decompensated uh, cardiac failure which basically uh, will lead to death okay now the features of this type of cardiac failure is that uh, the again the retention the fluid retention is more and more so remember the three things uh, keep that in mind the three things so in this uh, a failing heart together with kidneys progressive uh, the word progressive means it increases in degree but with the passage of time and retains more and more and more fluid and this basically caused the uh, msfp to increase progressively uh, and then there's a progressive increase in right, right atrial pressure and eventually the heart becomes so stretched and or edematous that it just cannot even maintain a a low cardiac output or a or a minimum decent cardiac output and then it fails completely which leads to death okay now if you look at this you will hardly recognize this as a cardiac function curve it's so bad okay so this constant line here is the it was the gold standard of the cardiac output the five beta per minute but look at this heart so it basically uh, the it's 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 point a is way down at half of the cardiac failure okay and then look at look at its uh, uh, its projection it's very bad it's it's like an arc uh, so it it does try to address the issue the failing heart and the rest of the the, the sympathetic nervous system and all that it it tries to improve the situation but uh, look at the position of b as compared to a it's not much uh, it does go to c and d and then these two are the highest points uh, which then uh, lead to uh, the final decline the e and then the f okay and uh, you can appreciate here that the basically what is the normal msfp it's around it's 7 mmh okay and at point f it's it's uh, 16 okay uh, so this is a this is a problem uh, the right atrial pressure so so much right, right atrial pressure is a problem and then uh, this is this is the, this is the cardiac function curve of a decompensated heart so what do we do obviously we cannot let this happen sit and uh, let the guy die out of uh, the eventual decompensation so basically the treatment is uh, quite literally the mirror effect of what the body does itself what does the do body do first the first thing the first port of call sympathetic stimulation right so in treatment you have cardiotonic drugs which basically help the heart in its pumping ability digitalis is that number one drug that we give uh, to improve cardiac output and what does it, it, it belongs to a, a group of drugs called cardiotonic glycosides and what do they do how do they help they basically uh, improve the availability of calcium inside myocardial fibers uh, so that they are available more uh, in this uh, time of need okay um, 
And normally what happens is very quickly, uh, you must have studied this in uh, the physiology of myocardium uh, in heart physiology, just to quick, quickly revise. Uh, the calcium, uh, when it comes out into the cytoplasm, so that it becomes available for actin myosin contraction in the cardiac muscle. Uh, it then, when it detaches, it then is exported out of the cell because it's not needed right now, right? Uh, when it's when it's removed from the uh, cytoplasm, it's absent. What digitalis does basically is it inhibits the sodium potassium ATPase. Now, what has sodium potassium ATPase have have to do anything with calcium? It does because the calcium is removed uh, basically by uh, exchanging it with sodium and it's this sodium calcium exchange that gets disrupted when you inhibit the sodium potassium ATPase the calcium stays inside and it's basically available for for a greater amount of time to improve the uh, uh, contraction of the heart so that's that day. and we also can we also can give uh, sympathomimetic drugs to improve the heart uh, to, to some extent of course the heart is fragile at the moment and these things need to be tapered accordingly. What is what was number two? The number two thing that uh, was menacing in the uh, mild cardiac failure was the fluid congestion, right? The, uh, the collection of fluid uh, uh, in, the, in the, the tissues or in the lungs. Uh, to, to address that, and that is basically what has created an absolute uh, frenzy here, uh, the fluid. Uh, we give uh, a, class of the, a class of drugs called diuretics, uh, which basically, induce increase kidney excretion of fluid they tell the kidney they they actually uh, take control of the kidney and start to excrete more fluid uh, bypassing the kidney's habit of decreasing uh, fluid output when the perfusion pressure decreases that's like an inbuilt thing that makes sense to the kidney but now you are giving a drug which bypasses that habit and basically increases uh, fluid uh, excretion by the kidney. Okay, so that's that. Okay, so there's a special mention of the peripheral edema in persistent cardiac failure, which basically is the chronic phase of any type of cardiac failure. The edema is a problem, uh, and and hence uh, a, a slide just to discuss that caused by the long-term uh, retention of fluid by kidneys. What are the contributing factors of this formation of edema? Is basically a decreased GFR, glomerular filtration rate. We'll be discussing this in detail in second year, renal physiology. Uh, but I'm sure you've heard about this. Uh, the nephron has a glomerulus, which basically is the place where the, the fluid is filtered and then new filtrate is formed. Filtrate then goes into the tubule and then all sorts of mechanisms happen you know, on this fluid and eventually it becomes urine. All this process basically decreases when there is cardiac failure. And it's because of this that you don't form enough GFR the fluid is retained in the body and that adds to the edema, okay? Number two is the activation of renin angiotensin system. We have discussed this in blood pressure control. You know that. Uh, and eventually we know that it increases uh, reabsorption of water and salt through the aldosterone, ald aldosterone mechanism. Thirdly, uh, the uh, aldosterone sec secretion, as I just mentioned, uh, for is basically activation of sympathetic nervous system, which is the first stay, is the first response of, of the compensatory mechanisms as discussed in the previous slide. Now, this activation of sympathetic nervous system itself uh, leads to further problems that add to your edema. And th these issues include uh, a couple of issues, a couple of points. One is uh, it basically vasoconstricts the afferent arteriole of the glomerulus. Okay. Uh, and again, when you read it in detail next year, uh, this basically is a very significant factor. Uh, when you vasoconstrict the afferent, the feeding vessel of the glomerulus, you are basically decreasing the supply of blood into the glomerulus, uh, which of course will lead to decreased GFR and add to the uh, dumping of blood uh, in, the, in, the, in the body i.e. you are decreasing the access of blood into the, into the kidney itself. Uh, so this, in this way, you are dumping the blood, you're retaining the blood in the circulation and adding to the woes of this, uh, this patient. Uh, number two is a sympathetic nervous system also activates uh, increased salt and water reabsorption by tubular epithelial cells. There are alpha 
adrenergic receptors on those on those cells, those tubular epithelial cells of the nephron. Uh, when the sympathetic stimulation occurs, uh, it triggers, it enhances their salt and water reabsorption. Again, adding to the ECF volume, again, adding to the fluid retention, the edema formation, okay? Three is again, uh, uh, this sympathetic nervous system also activates renin and the, the entire cascade of events that renin then triggers, eventually leading to increased uh, salt and water reabsorption again making problems for edema formation and finally it actually also activates adh which is antidiuretic hormone uh, uh, from the hypothalamus and this hormone basically as the name indicates it is designed to retain water in in cases where there's dehydration but in this situation uh, sympathetic nervous system directly activates it uh, the board the, the kidney then starts to retain extra water and as you can imagine this is not the desired situation uh, in an already developing and menacing edema uh, in the setting of heart failure. 